Um, today we're just going to go over a few basics, why we need compost, different methods of composting, compost science, kind of what's going on in that bin of yours, um, the benefits of compost, and then how to fix common problems that might arise in your backyard bin. So, according to the EPA, um, in 2018 alone, EP the EPA estimates that about 63 million tons of food waste were generated in the commercial, institutional, and residential sectors. EPA estimates that in 2018, the United States, in, in the United States, more food reached landfills and combustion facilities than any other single material in our everyday trash. Additionally, the U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates that in 2010, 31% or 133 billion pounds of the 430 billion pounds of food produced was not available for human consumption at the retail or consumer levels. Um, in my senior year of college, as part of a larger project on sustainability, I measured food waste at a, during a lunch period in a kindergarten through fifth grade school. The school had about 250 kids and um, so they'd go in, get their lunch. They had 20 minutes to eat and they got a piece of pizza, a side of veggies, an orange and a red jello cup. Um, I'm from Utah where the state food is jello. So depending on your uh, opinion on jello, that was either an awesome day or the worst day at school. Um, <laughs> the kids have 20 minutes to eat. So they have to go fast, so they eat and then they get to go outside. So of course they're gonna go quickly. And during that waste or that lunch period, they wasted almost 600 pounds of food. Um, totally untouched food, unopened oranges, untouched jello cups, so much whipped cream. Um, it's a perfect example of how our food is treated. According to the EPA, wasted food is defined as food that was not used for its intended purpose and is managed in a variety of ways, such as donation. Creation of animal feed, composting, anaerobic digestion, or sending to landfills and combustion facilities. The vast majority of food is not donated and most of it is thrown away. Oh, I forgot to mention this. If you guys have any questions, feel free to feel free to drop them in the um, chat. And if you uh, want to, we can save time at the end and I can answer any questions that come up. <clears throat> So I thought this uh, comic was very funny and it'll make a little bit more sense in a minute, but he says the anaerobic ones are just sitting there, but the aerobic bacteria are doing jumping jack sit-ups and leg lifts. So generally when organic matter, such as a fallen tree in the woods decomposes, it goes through anaerobic decomposition, or excuse me, it goes through aerobic decomposition, meaning the microorganisms that require oxygen, like fungus and types of bacteria do the work of decomposition. A tree fallen um, next to a trail is a great place to observe this. You can see all the fungus, you can see all the little worms and creatures that are in there, eating it away, breaking it down. You can also smell that really good earthy smell that's always in the woods. And that is a great sign in a good, healthy aerobic decomposition. However, according to the Agency for Toxic Substances and Dis Disease Registry, ATSDR, when food ends up in a solid waste landfill, it is buried under massive amounts of other trash and becomes very compacted. This is, this means it's cut off from the good happy decomposers um, and the bacteria that doesn't require oxygen takes over. The refuse must be broken down by anaerobic decomposition and this leads to fermentation, volatization and chemical reactions. You can watch this process happen if you were to fill a plastic trash bag with grass clippings and tie it off. The clippings will eventually break down, but the bag will fill with gases and a sort of organic sludge. And it will also absolutely smell awful if you were to open up the bag. That is the result of an anaerobic breakdown. That's also why when you leave leftovers in your fridge for too long and they're sealed in a Tupperware, it's gonna to start to smell really gross. Um, all of the gases that it is releasing are those nasty, nasty landfill gases like methane. Uh, there are many different factors affecting the land levels of landfill gases that landfills release. Older refuse releases fewer gases than newer. Higher moisture content leads to more gases as the moisture encourages bacterial activity. Warmer temperatures lead to more gas production. 
and the largest contributor is the higher content organic matter of organic matter in the landfills. The higher amounts of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen, and hydrogen sulfide are produced. So the approximate math is that every 100 pounds of food waste in a landfill sends 8.3 pounds of methane into the atmosphere. And methane is one of the worst of the greenhouse gases in that it contributes to warming much, quick, much more quickly than carbon dioxide. So not only do landfills full of organic matter produce a lot more landfill gases, but the product of anaerobic decomposition is chock full of pathogens and parasites. So that means that even if it was to break all the way down in the landfill and you were going to go save that um, soil or hummus as it's called, um, that hummus would have to be quarantined for up to a year to make sure that the soil and was healthy and the parasites were all gone. Um, so gross. <laughs> Chemical fertilizers, chemical runoff is actually a huge issue, especially here in a watershed like we live in. I'm sure if you go outside right now or over the past couple of days where it's been warm, you've seen those streams of water running down. Um, I have a great video yesterday of the water running down our stairs directly into the lake. And that water is actually carrying away any chemical fertilizers that have been placed on the ground but weren't observed by plants. So this is going to go ahead and contribute to that cyanobacteria blooms that we absolutely don't want in our lakes. And then lots of invasive species love, love, love to be fertilized. They love that higher nitrogen, they love that higher phosphate. So what do we do about it? Um, here we are gonna edit the traditional reduce, reuse, to recycle to add two more. So refuse, refuse what you don't need. If you don't need a product, you don't have to take it. And that's a hard one to learn how to say no to things. Um, reduce, reduce what you purchase, um, reuse what you have. I love reusing old jars, it's my favorite thing in the whole world. <clears throat> Recycle what you can, and then rot or compost what you need to. So here is the EPA's food recovery hierarchy, and this is an awesome graphic that applies to both large and small scale agriculture. So large scale, big, huge farmers, and then us, maybe we have a background or a backyard garden. Maybe we don't have a garden and we just buy from the grocery store and that's great too. So first up, reduce the amount of excess food that we buy. So for me, this means meal planning, making sure I have a grocery list, um, planning meals that require similar ingredients. So if I have to buy a whole head of celery, I'm not just gonna use two sticks of celery and then let the rest of it go bad. Um, Donating extra food, so feeding hungry people is next. For me, this means going through my um, pantry and if I see something that's nearing its expiration date but isn't to the expiration date and I know I'm not gonna use it, taking that to a food pantry. Um, feeding animals, I grew up with uh, chickens my whole life and so we ended up giving them so many of our food scraps and so they were super happy and super excited about veggie stems and fruit cores. They were always happy to see us coming out with that bucket. <laughs> um, and then industrial uses, not super applicable to most communities. Where I'm from in Salt Lake City, we actually had an industrial like food rendering place that would turn uh, food scraps into biofuel, which is a really cool thing that's happening these days. Um, however, it's not super widely available. I haven't seen anything like that here yet. Um, so if anybody knows about that, let me know. And then we are going to move on to composting. So we're finally getting to what we're all here for. So the NRDC defines composting as the natural process of recycling organic matter, such as leaves and food scraps, into a valuable fertilizer that can enrich soil and plants. So everything that grows, animals, plants, etc., decomposes eventually after death. If not for this natural process, life on earth would be impossible. Our soil would not be able to grow anything. And even if we could somehow live through this, all the ones living creatures would stack up on top of each other and we just wouldn't be able to exist anymore. Um, so I'm really grateful for decomposition. Um, it's also great for our soils to break that into that good, good black gold. So moving on to the recipe for compost. Compost breaks down into a really basic recipe. You're gonna need food, air, and water, just like us. 
So we'll start with food. This magic ratio is three to one. So for every one part green, you're going to need three parts brown or one part nitrogen, three parts carbon. Your browns are going to be your substrate. So wood shavings, coconut coir, dry leaves, straw or hay, shredded paper, as long as it's brown, not glossy. Um, and then that carbon or the browns are gonna be the solution for many problems you'll uh, run across in your composting. Um, your greens are gonna be your food scraps and your yard scraps. So grass and garden clippings and most food scraps that come out of your kitchen are awesome to go into your compost bin. You can post, put most things in, fruit and veggie peels, food that has started to go bad. The main question is what shouldn't go into your compost bin and that is going to be meat, bones, produce stickers, and twist ties. That also includes quote unquote compostable or biodegradable plastics, which are highly unlikely to break down in backyard composting. Those are gonna require more of that industrial size composting. So in industrial compost composters, they're really good at monitoring temperature. It's going to be always the same and it's a constant turning. So that's actually gonna have that available environment for um, that. Uh, Donna asks, can you use cardboard for brown? Absolutely, you can use cardboard. Um, just make sure there's no tape on there and you're gonna wanna cut it or tear it into smaller pieces because those larger chunks are going to um, collapse and take a lot longer to break down. In compost, the smaller things are, the better, the easier it is. So for example, eggshells, if you're gonna throw those in there, I suggest like, crushing them up. Cardboard, paper should all be shredded down into smaller, smaller pieces. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, if you are composting your yard scraps, you're gonna wanna avoid any invasive species. So I'm looking at some uh, milfoil or some bittersweet. Bittersweet particularly is an evil, evil creature. We all know that, but it has little teeny tiny seeds that can sometimes survive the composting um, process. So you're gonna wanna not throw those in there. Those should be for the burn pile, unfortunately. Um, you should also not add cut flowers. So if you get a beautiful bouquet for Valentine's Day or a birthday, make sure not to throw those into your compost bin because those are often sprayed with a anti-decomp spray to keep them alive longer. And we don't want that anti-decomp spray in our <laughs> compost bin. It's going to absolutely go in the op opposite direction of what we really want. Um, let's see. Checking your tea bags to make sure that they do not have plastic either in the bag or the string before you put them in is gonna be a key thing to do. We don't wanna add microplastics to our compost, of course. We don't want microplastics added anywhere. Um, if you're not sure about that tea bag, I would just advise throwing that into your garbage. Um, another thing to check on, we're gonna limit dairy and citrus. Dairy is mostly for the smell um, if you dump a whole gallon of milk into your compost, it's going to smell pretty bad, unfortunately. But small amounts occasionally are okay. Um, citrus fruits can become can cause the or can cause the compost to become too acidic. So occasional orange and lemon peels are fine, but you're not going to want to make six gallons of lemonade and then drop all the peels into your compost. Not ideal. So for storing your greens, there are lots and lots of different ways to um, store your greens. So for us at the SLA, we just have a five gallon bucket in our kitchen and all of our food scraps go directly into that. And then we empty that right into our compost bin. However, because composting is becoming trendier, which is great news for all of us, um, there's lots of really cool inventions that are coming out onto the market. So the like silver thing over here, these vents have charcoal in them. So supposedly it's supposed to smell better or like have no smell at all. Um, there's also like these cool interior cabinet mounts or these little really beautiful looking bins. However, the more beautiful I've learned, <laughs> the more expensive. Some of these bins are coming in at hundreds of dollars when you could just use a plastic gallon bucket that you have laying around, that's up to you. 
Um, one thing to note is that many compost storage bins come with liners. Some liners are made from brown paper, which is great, that's gonna decay super easily. However, some come with plastic like that biodegradable plastic bag. These are gonna say they're compostable, um, but like compostable plastic, it's not going to break down necessarily in your backyard. Um, so we just generally put our food directly into our bucket, dump it out, spray it out, and then we're good to go. All right, moving on to the air section of the compost recipe. So just like in a landfill, if you are going to stack all of your food scraps on top of each other and never touch them, it will eventually decompose. However, you're going to run more into that anaerobic environment where it's gonna to start to smell and it won't be necessarily the healthiest compost ever created. So to counteract that, we are going to mix our compost or aerate our compost. To do that, you can just use a pitchfork, a stick, any type of tool that can reach down to the bottom. And you're gonna reach down their stab and flip it over. So some people call it turning your compost, mixing your compost, whatever you wanna call it. Um, as long as you do it, that's gonna be great. Um, it's also gonna make your compost uh, go faster. So the breakdown process will happen faster with more air in there. How often you turn your compost is up to you. You usually don't have to turn it up over every day, depending on what type of composting you're doing. So you can go ahead and experiment with how often you do it. If you have more time, turning it more often is great. If you don't, that's okay too. Um, the best compost is the compost that you are actually making. So <laughs> make it work for you. For us, our compost bin turns when we add scraps into the bin which is gonna happen a couple of times a week, depending on how much food we're wasting, I guess. Um, and finally, water. Water is a super important part of our compost, um, but also can be harmful. So the moisture in your compost bin comes primarily from food scraps you have. Compost bins shouldn't be completely dry as that will reduce the ability of the decomposers. They also shouldn't be dripping wet. So it's a balance you kind of have to pick up as you go along. Finished compost can be tested through the squeeze test. So if you grab a handful of your compost and squeeze it, it should feel somewhat like a wrung out sponge. So it shouldn't be like dripping wet, but it shouldn't feel bone dry, um, just like a sponge that you've just squeezed out after washing your dishes. <clears throat> there are many different types of composting and different types work better for different situations. You can make it about as complicated as you want to. Um, like Just like this graph says, you can go so many different directions. There are lots of considerations when deciding which type of composting is right for you. So first of all is the amount of space you have. Do you have a huge backyard that you have lots of room to play with? Or do you live in a small apartment with maybe no green space? Second, think of the time and energy you want to put in the bin. All composting is going to require some effort. However, some types require much more and others require you to just sort of dump your scraps and go. So today we're gonna to focus on a few of these more accessible types and more common types of backyard composting. So first of all is going to be direct composting. This is the oldest, tail's oldest time type of composting, least time intensive, um, really easy. All you're going to do is dig a hole, dump your food scraps in there, cover it up. Um, you can add more scraps by digging it back out and pouring more in, covering it loosely with dirt every time. When the hole is full, you just dig a different hole. You don't have to do much and it will attract more worms and decomposers to your garden. However, this type of composting takes the longest because it's more on that anaerobic side of things. And it's also going to possibly attract animals to your yard to dig it up and spread it all over the place. Also, you will have to keep digging holes in your backyard if this is your chosen method. So that's something to consider. So definitely something you can do if you have a lot more space, but you also don't want to um, dedicate too much time to it. Pre-made bins are awesome for someone who doesn't want to build their own bin, doesn't produce a lot of food scraps, and has a smaller outdoor space to operate in. 
These operate, as you can see here, they have that open bottom and then sometimes like a two or three layer bins up here, which you can move around and adjust. Um, however, these can get pretty expensive. When I did a quick Google search of some of these, you can get some bins for like $100. Other bins are you're looking at more like five, six, seven hundred dollars $700, which seems like a lot to me um, for a plastic bin. However, it's a super easy setup. Often you'll need to buy at least two of these bins, sometimes more, because once one bin is full, you're going to have to start, close that one off and um, begin in your second bin. Let's see, Elizabeth asks, how do you prevent tree roots from growing up into direct compost? Um, for the direct compost, that's gonna be something that might happen. I guess I don't know exactly if it would. You could always line it with like a pit liner or a weed liner um, if you would like to stop those tree roots. Um, it could also be helpful as it's growing through there, um, hopefully attracting more uh, worms and other bugs. So I could definitely look more into that, Elizabeth. Let's see. Um, like I was saying, the compost bins, you can use two or three of these pre-made bins because they're kind of small. And sometimes compost takes a month to mature, sometimes it takes a year to mature, depending on how often you are monitoring it, turning it, and what the weather looks like outside. Oops. So tumblers are a great option for someone with limited space, but extra time on their hands. These work by adding your food scraps to these internal bins, and then you're going to turn it by hand every day. Um, what's great about these is they work fairly fast because you're turning them almost every day. That air is in there, it's working hard. The um, bacteria is really has the time to get in there and break it down quickly. However, these are gonna require, of course, a large time commitment and a strong arm, <laughs> unless you are willing to invest in a or a mechanized version. These are also going to require some form of inoculation um, as they aren't touching the ground. So you can toss handfuls of dirt, um, handfuls of finished compost into there to actually bring the bacteria inside. Otherwise, it's just not gonna have enough to actually do that decomposition. Uh, moving on, combination is what we use here at the Squaw Mice Association. Um, basically, we've taken aspects from different types of composting that we like and combined it into our homemade bins. So as you can see here, these are our bins. We have two of them set up right now, and they are a simple, super, or a super simple construction of four pallets nailed together. And then you can kind of see they are wrapped in chicken wire, and this is going to deter any larger pests. Um, Ideally, you could also throw a weed barrier again down in the bottom to help prevent those smaller critters, those um, little bears getting in there like mice. Um, generally, obviously it's covered in snow right now, but there's a pile of hay over here and that is where um, we keep our browns. Um, so for us, this bin currently, this one closer to the camera, is closed and that is in the middle of its maturation stage. So there's really good yummy compost down here at the bottom. And then over here, this is our active bin. You can see our little pitchfork in there. Um, we turn it when we add compost, like I mentioned earlier, or when we add food scraps. Um, this isn't a perfect system, but it works really well for us. It does require initial setup if you're gonna build your own bins. And you can definitely experiment a lot at the beginning to see what you like. Um, but that's also a positive thing. If you realize there's lots of wildlife in your bin, you can add a lid to your bin. Um, if you realize it's too wet, you can always um, add a lid or move it to a different location. Uh, Donna asks if we compost in the winter, and we do compost in the winter, we are actively adding to these bins at all time. So something cool about compost is that even in the winter, it's still producing warmth. Those bacteria on the inside are actually still actively working. They're just working a lot slower than usual. So there's lots of different ways to handle winter composting. For us, we just add directly on top of our bin um, and keep going even when it's frozen. Other people 
Um, I saw earlier this week, a gentleman had a trash can with a lid that he could tie down right next to his house. And he put all of his food scraps in there. So come spring, he could just directly dump that whole bin into his uh, compost bin and then add the browns and mix it to the appropriate dryness. Um, there's lots of different ways to handle it. That's, I think for us, it's easiest just to keep adding um, and it will freeze and then come spring right now, <laughs> in fact, it'll start to warm up and those bacteria will start working even harder and even faster, which is exciting. Um, yeah, super adjustable, play with it. You can do whatever you want with it, really. All right, vermicomposting or worm bins is the form of composting that uses worms to aid in the process of decomposition. Worms are one of our best friends when it comes to decomp. Worm castings are one of the best things you can add to soil. Um, they are powerhouses at breaking down hard to break down substances like cellulose. And they also create worm tea, which is like a really healthy, delicious liquid to put in your soil and not to actually drink like I made it sound like you could. Um, super beneficial to soil health overall. Worms are awesome for indoor composting because they are not that smelly. I have a friend um, who's been vermicomposting for two or maybe three years under her counter. And I literally had no idea the bin was down there. I could not smell it. I didn't know what was happening until she literally opened it up and we're like, here's my worms. Um, it's super easy to maintain generally. There's lots of specifics for setting up a worm bin and there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, so it's definitely a little bit more of an initial investment into figuring out what's working for you. Um, for my friend who's composting under her cupboard in her little apartment, her bin is just a big plastic bin with a lid that she can snap down on top. And then she adds shredded paper and her worms and food scraps. Some people use a double level bin, so you're gonna have one whole bin and then a smaller one that goes inside with holes drilled in the bottom. So that's the worm tea can, and extra liquid can drain out into that bottom setup. Um, the best setup work, or the best setup is the one that works for you. Um, and because I've been talking for a long time, I thought we could watch this fun little um, time lapse of worms breaking down different substances. All right, can everybody hear me now? Great. 
Um, before we move on to the next section, does anyone have any more questions about uh, different types of composting? All right, moving on. If you do, don't worry, just go ahead and throw it in the chat or at the end. <clears throat> so moving on, we are going to ask the question, who is at work in your compost bin? Um, as we've discussed, compost comes from a big mixture of different things. A pile of only hay will not magically become compost on its own. The correct mix of ingredients will nurture all the good creatures um, if you do the actual breaking down. Oh, before we move on, Jenna asked why ice was added to the worm piles. Ice is actually a great way to control the moisture of adding to your worm bin um, because instead of just soaking your whole worms with a ton of water all at once, the ice is going to me melt really gently down through your bin. Um, you don't have to add ice. You can definitely just like pour with a watering can over the top, but just a slower way to introduce water. Um, who's working your compost bin? So when a compost bin is started, the primary decomposer is the mesophilic bacteria. These bacteria are going to appear anywhere between 50 and 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And these guys are going to start the decomposition um, process. As they do their job, they are going to produce heat off of their little bodies. Um, and the heat is going to help break that compost down as well. And in fact, they will actually heat up the compost bin so much that they can no longer live there. And that is when the thermophilic bacteria are going to take over. These guys are going to thrive between 110 and 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So the center of a compost bin can get super, super hot, which is awesome. Um, these guys are going to do lots of the simple breakdown work. So all of the like internal breaking down of little compound or like larger compounds into individual pieces. And the bacteria will continue to work for as long as they need to to reach the maturation stage in which the majority of the pile has decomposed. And that's when fungi and actin actinomycytes, I knew I was gonna say that incorrectly in here, um, that's when they are gonna take over. And these are amazing actors in the composting process. So these guys can break down even the hardest to break down components to, components of food, like lignins, which are the rigid part of organic polymers that lend to the structure of cell walls, proteins, and chitines, which are the, poly ugh, the polymers that make up exoskeletons and fish scales. Fungus mycelium are an awesome force. So fungus mycelium are kind of like the roots of uh, fungus, and they are going to get into all of the hard to break down places and pull it apart. Each tiny strand has incredibly um, strong polymers inside them and they can pull apart almost anything. These two categories of decomposers must be in harmony. We need to main, we need the mainstay of the work to be done by the bacteria while the fungus and actinomycytes come in and turn the middle stage uh, material into the actual compost. Of course there are a lot more creatures in your compost bin than just bacteria and fungus. Um, Lots of critters will find their way in there, and for the most part, this is great news. While microscopic decomposers do the majority of the chemical de decomposition, macroinvertebrates play a major role in physical decomposition. This process happens when a macroinvertebrate eats something, digests it, and defecates it, which releases super nutrient-rich compost. Nematodes and mites are incredibly common in bins and will continue the breakdown process. If you were to magnify the contents of your bin, you're going to find thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of them in each handful of compost. Pill bugs are an excellent find in your um, bin. These guys are super adept at breaking down cellulose, which is kind of hard to break down, so it's a good thing to see. In turn, the waste they produce is great food for microbes. So it's kind of that ecosystem within your compost that each little critter is feeding another critter. <laughs> Um, they are also ind indicative of when to turn your pile. So if you start to see a ton of pill bugs, like way more than ever before, it's time to aerate, turn it over. Um, millipedes and black flies or black soldier flies are awesome vegetarians who break through a lot of that hard to break down matter. 
And of course, worms, as we discussed, awesome, awesome for your bins. Quoting from Texas A&M again, um, as soil or organic matter is passed through an earthworm's, earthworm's digestive system, it is broken up and neutralized by secretions of calcium carbonate from calciferous glands near the worm's gizzard. Once in the gizzard, material is finely ground prior to digestion. Digestive intestinal juices rich in hormone, hormones, enzymes, and other fermenting substances continue the breakdown process. The matter passes out of the worm's body in form of casts, which are the richest and finest quality of all material. Fresh casts are markedly higher in bacteria, organic material, available nitrogen, calcium, and magnesium, and available phosphor phosphorus and potassium than soil itself. So it is awesome to have all of these little guys in your bins. However, not all bugs that you find in your bins are super, super helpful. Rove beetles are great to have in your garden. Um, they are the enemies of snails, slugs, and maggots. However, in your compost bin, they may just start to predate on those good bugs like pill bugs. And we want those around. So taking care of those by leaving your bin out in the sun is always a great way to um, reduce the levels of beetles. Ants can mean that your pile is too dry. So keeping an even moisture level from bottom to top is going to keep ants away from your bin. And then earthworm mites, of course, are going to be preying on earthworms, which we don't want. We want those earthworms in our bin. So exposing your bin to sunlight, again, will keep these populations in check. So like I said, um, your uh, compost bin is a total ecosystem in itself. Mites and springtails eat fungi. Tiny feathered wing beetles feed on fungal spores. Nematodes ingest bacteria. Protozoa and rotifiers present in water films feed on bacteria and plant particles. Predaceous mites and pseudoscorpions prey upon nematodes, fly larvae, other mites, and columbolins. Free living flatworms ingest gastropods, earthworms, nematodes, and rotifiers. Third level consumers such as centipedes, rope beetles, ground beetles, and ants prey upon the second level consumers. These creatures will function best at medium or mesothelic temperatures, so they will not be in the pile at all times. So we'd want to just foster this really healthy environment in our bins so that this ecosystem continue, can continue to thrive. Um, until once you have reached a good, healthy, mature compost bin where it's like actively producing good, healthy compost, it's almost self-maintaining. As long as you're adding that food and uh, turning it, it's gonna do the work for you. So moving on, we're gonna talk a little bit about common issues in our um, compost bins. So now that we know how to build them, we can uh, keep them healthy. So if your compost is too wet, something that you might run into here during like rainy season or right now when the snow is all melting, um, too much mud will create that anaerobic decomposition, and that is going to make your compost bin smell super sour. Um, that's that really like almost sickly sweet smell that you smell sometimes when you're walking by like a garbage can. So to combat this, you can do a couple of things. Adding more browns, um, that paper, that cardboard, those sticks and leaves are going to help soak that uh, moisture up. Um, if your compost is out in the open, you could always add a lid or move it to a covered spot like under a carport. And then if you know a heavy, heavy rainstorm is coming, you can also throw a tarp over the top of your compost bin to help keep that moisture level in check. Again, a weird smell is going to often usually come from your compost being too wet, like I mentioned before. But another reason could be that something in your compost is not supposed to be there, such as dairy or meat or bones. So those are going to rot um, differently than the rest of the contents of your bin. So you're gonna want to make sure you avoid putting large quantities of dairy in there and try to avoid meat and bones altogether. Too dry. Compost being too dry is super easy to diagnose just by looking at it. It's gonna be dusty, it will break apart, um, it will look like the decomposition um, has just stopped because it definitely has slowed down in this situation. And like I said before, you might find ants. If your bin is too dry, it's super easy to fix. You can add water. You can either add more wet scraps like leafy greens, that kind of thing to your bin, 
or you can just spray it down with your hose, turn it, and make sure you're getting that water evenly distributed. And finally, we are moving on to the conclusion. Um, how do you tell when your compost is finished maturing? The best answer I can give you is you kind of know it when you see it. All the large organic materials will be broken down. And as you can see in this picture, it basically looks like really healthy black dirt. And once you get to this point, the uses for your compost are almost endless. Compost is known as black gold because of its amazing benefits. Most finished compost has a pH near neutral and contains low levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. When you mix it into your soil, compost acts like a slow release fertilizer, releasing um, all those healthy nutrients without the harmful parts of chemical fertilizers. It also helps latch onto nutrients added in the form of fertilizer and prevents them 